Hello everyone, my name's Mark and you're watching Resource Talks. What you're not watching, however, is anything that is intended to be financial advice. Please do pause the video and read the disclaimer on your screen. I'm pleased in this episode to be joined by Guillaume Pitron, who is a French documentarian, a journalist, and the author of a book that we are going to discuss at length which is of great interest for investors in the natural resources space. It's called The Rare Metals War, The Dark Side of Clean Energy and Digital Technologies. Guillaume, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure to be here. In The Rare Metals War, uh, you kick off by making the claim that rare earth elements are bringing about a third energy and industrial revolution. So the first revolution was that brought about by the coal-driven steam engine in the 18th century, and the second, the uh, petrol-driven combustion engine revolution of the 19th century. Um, but I suppose my first question for you would be, what are rare earth elements, uh, and how exactly are they comparable with coal or, or petrol? Sure. As you mentioned, Mark, every energy transition is first an industrial revolution. And we've been through two industri industrial revolutions in the 18th and 19th century. For the first one was a steam engine. And then the 20th century was a revolution of the 4T motor. For the first one, we needed coal to uh, run uh, steam engines. For the second one, we needed oil. And now we want to get rid of oil and coal because it's uh, dirty, because it's uh, responsible for climate change. We want to do a third industrial revolution, which is called the energy transition. Uh, we want to get rid of these fossil fuels and we want to replace uh, such motors and steam engines by wind turbines, um, solar panels. Uh, this is a way to produce green electricity. Then we need to, you know, uh, transport that electricity and that is high tension uh, electricity networks and then such an electricity which is a new commodity needs like oil to be stored but it's not stored in a barrel anymore it's stored in batteries so whether you want to extract these commodities for making green energy transport such an, such an electricity and then store it you need metals and you need, among other things, uh, rare earths, which are necessary for um, uh, for 90% uh, of the uh, motors of electric cars. But uh, you also need uh, lithium for batteries, cobalt, nickel, manganese, iron, phosphates for batteries. You need copper for the electricity grids. And you also need other metals of the rare earths family uh, in order to uh, run electric cars, among other technologies. So basically, you know, turning away from oil and coal means actually nurturing a new dependency upon such metals. And uh, this is very clear when we read uh, International Energy Agency reports, for example. The EIA is based in Paris and produces a report as to how much of these resources we're going to need in the next 20 years for making the Paris Agreement a reality. And their findings is that in the next 20 years, we're going to have to extract and consume 42 times more lithium, 24 times more graphite and cobalt, seven times more rare earths uh, in 2040 comparing to our needs in 2020 to make the green world possible. So the very idea here is to make a parallel between coal, oil, metals, including rare earths, to answer your point, and to show that we're not, you know, you know, you know, we're shifting dependencies, we're shifting away from falling oil and fuel by nurturing a new dependency upon these metals. And yet, according to a statistic in your book, the rare earths market is about 270 times smaller than the oil market. So I suppose you foresee some sort of convergence in, in the market caps of these two markets. These are small markets. Obviously, uh, we talk sometimes about minor metals or rare metals. 
because they are more rare in the Earth's crust than base metals. For example, rare earths, which is a family of 15 metals, rare earths are naturally uh, melted in the Earth's crust with iron. Um, so basically, when you extract a rock from an iron uh, deposit, you find iron and also some rare earths such as neodymium. Now, on average, neodymium is 1,250 times, on average, more diluted in the Earth's crust than, than iron. That means that when you separate and, and refine one kg of iron, you end up with actually less than a gram of neodymium. So that just gives you a slight idea about how diluted these metals can be. Uh, regarding rare earths, it's a market which amounts today to about 200,000 tons, so which is very few comparing to base metals markets such as iron. Obviously, yes. Yet, we can't do without these metals. We can't do without them. We can't replace them. We can't substitute them. Or if we can replace them, it's replace them by another uh, metal which is less efficient. So our modern technologies, whether they're digital or whether they're green technologies, are strongly made, uh, strongly dependent upon rare earths and other metals such as cobalt, nickel, lithium, as as, as I mentioned. So in in a way uh, the, the, the the it's 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 uh, it's 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 less to to extract but it's harder to extract at a more expensive price and that's what makes actually investors reluctant to 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 invest in such a market it's hard to explore it's hard to find a profitable deposit a potentially profitable deposit usually it is a business of junior of junior, uh, junior companies and when they find an interesting deposit you can make sure that they're going to get uh, bought by a bigger company. But huge, uh, you know, and most important uh, mining companies such as, for example, Rio Tinto, uh, Valley, uh, or, or American um, uh, Anglo-American, are not very keen in investing in such metals. It's not really reward. Uh, it's not really uh, financially rewardable in, in the short and medium term. Mm. Um you mentioned the application of batteries, um, but what other applications are there for rare earth metals? Uh, for example, in, in your book, you, you cite a statistic that every person on the planet consumes on average 20 grams of rare earth metals per year, which is clearly a trifling amount. And yet you go on to say that the world would run infinitely slower without them. So, so why is that? Yeah, well, uh, just to make a precision mark, um, rare earths are not being used in batteries. They are being used in motors of most of the electric cars. That's just a pure detail, a technical detail, but to, to, just to, to precise that. Rare earths can be used also, uh, well, in your everyday life, in your phone, for example. Uh, you know, uh, rare earths is what makes us silent. Thanks to rare earths into my iPhone 7, my phone is on a vibrating mode. And what vibrates is a magnet made of neodymium, which is rare earth, uh, iron and boron. And the alloy of neodymium, iron, boron makes the magnet and the magnets makes my phone silent. Uh, so that is as simply as simple as that. We don't even know about the existence of these rare earths, yet uh, they are everywhere in our uh, daily lives. Um, you, you once again mentioned that we consume a very tiny amount of them. Uh, I think I should probably reevaluate the figure of 20 grams, but obviously it's very few because uh, once again, you, you, you need a couple of grams of rare earths to completely change your life. They're also sometimes being, uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, claimed as, as being the vitamins of our modern technologies. You know, it's like a, a cooking recipe. You can cook anything you want, until the moment you add some salt. The salt is a very few amount of the of the of the dish that you've prepared, but that changes the, the, the total completely changes the, the taste of your dish. That's same with rare earths. It's it's like a vitamin or it's like the, an additive like 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 uh, like salt. You add a very few grams of it and that completely changes the entire recipe that is the the the, the digital devices itself that makes it much more uh, much quicker, much more efficient, much lighter, much lighter. Rare earths have brought miniaturization that has brought that has made our phones small rather than being the building blocks in the past. So we need a few of them, 
uh, we still have to multiply, uh, you know, to 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 put rare earths into the backdrop of other metals such as lithium, cobalt, nickel, and other likes. But obviously, yes, it's 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 nothing what we need. At the same time, we just can't do without them. Okay, and just drilling down into the application of rare earths in green energy. Well, mm -hmm. the green energy revolution. There's a consensus uniting figures as as diverse as politicians, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, even Pope Francis, um, that the world has to move towards these greener technologies like solar panels or wind turbines. But doing so, according to one forecast, would require extracting just a, a mind-boggling quantity of metals. Uh, another quote from your book, you say, over the next generation, we will consume more minerals than in the last 70,000 years or 500 generations before us. So in other words, our 7.5 billion contemporaries will absorb more mineral resources than the 108 billion humans that walk the earth today. So my question would be, is it possible to obtain the necessary metals uh, in order to achieve this green revolution that Macron and Greta Thunberg are pushing um, for us to adopt, or, or is it just so resource intensive that it would, wouldn't be practicable in your view? Sure. Well, first, Mark, I really need to insist upon the fact that this energy transition must be done. Uh, you don't find here with me any, uh, you know, opponent of the ecological transition, energy transition. I can't wait for the last day. <laughs> May it happen in time soon where we're going to consume the last drop of oil and the last gram of 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 coal. I, I really hope that that day is going to come anytime soon. That being said, as you understand, a low carbon world is a high resource world. And this is a paradox that we will need more resources, especially metals and minerals, in order to make the low carbon world possible. And that thing, that true reality, which cannot be discussed hasn't been talked about. It's not been addressed in the various COP that have been organized. I was participating recently in the COP27 in Charmel Cher, and I was invited for the first time uh, for a, a, a conference speaking about the rare earths and all the metals for the energy transition. That was the first time it had ever happened since the COP21. So that gives you an idea about how this question is not addressed now it's so important to speak about it. The question you ask is, will we have sufficient resources in the future to make the energy transition possible? From a strict geological standpoint, yes, there are you know, enough resources in the Earth's crust to make the energy revolution happen. Um, as I explained before, rare earths and rare metals are not really rare. They are diluted in the Earth's crust which means that you need to dig a lot in order to find a few grams of them. But because you have so many places where to dig, including in the oceans or in the asteroids, where you can also find metals that, you know, once again, on a, from a pure geological standpoint, you've got sufficient of these resources. But, you know, the question is, at what cost will we extract that? Uh, we need to dig digger. Uh, in order to to produce uh, to produce uh, metals, I was recently having a dinner with Mark Cutifani. He was still at the time CEO of uh, Anglo American, and Mark Cutifani was giving me a very interesting example. He said, "But you know, Guillaume, uh, for the last uh, today in 2022, it was last year, uh, we uh, had we have to." Um, extract 17 times more rock in order to come up with the same amount of copper than 100 years ago. So what's, that means that the deposits are much less uh, interesting than they used to be. You need to dig deeper in order to find the same amount of resource. That means a more important ecological cost, a more consumption of water, more consumption of electricity. Uh, it's not market if any saying this, no, it's me. Uh, more environmental impact, potential more uh, potentially more environment impactful uh, 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 mining techniques, a more social impact, a higher political impact, and all these impacts are coming as bottlenecks, and that is the reason why the 
mining resources available, but it's not necessarily mined because there are some limits for investors, limits from, for, 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 from an ecological standpoint and also limits from a social standpoint. Local communities just don't want to have a mine in, in, their, in their backyard. And the social risk, meaning local communities, including in Argentina, for example, not willing to actually let a lithium mine operate in, in their backyard because the water which is being used for refining the lithium is the water which could be used for actually growing some vegetables. There is a conflict of usages here. Well, this is the reason why it's, it's, it, it makes it hard to open new mines. So if you, once again, if I go back to your question, will we have sufficient resources? I say on the paper, yes. In reality, actually it's no. And if we look at the uh, projections which have been made recently by the International Energy Agency, well, they say, and I quote here Fatih Birol, the Secretary General of the EIA, uh, EIEA, he says there is a discrepancy, uh, there is a gap between our willingness to respect the two degree scenario and the availability of the resource that we need to make that scenario happen. So we might not have sufficient resources and the energy transition might be longer than we think, not uh, because of any political uh, 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 bottleneck, but because of, of lack of resources, lack of investors, uh, lack of uh, social agreement, lack of political support to a dirty business, uh, which is mine. Hmm. Coming on to the geopolitical side of the rare metals war. And, um, and Mark, you, Mark, just one point, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, that doesn't please, mean that we should yeah. invest in mines because we're speaking to investors. Uh, you know, that is a difficult business, but also, you know, extraction techniques, refining techniques are getting better. You see companies being much more involved into communications, making sure that local communities agree with the projects. Uh, mining is just absolutely necessary. And I always support the mining business here, trying to develop its own, uh, uh, you know, new, new, uh, new, new mining, uh, um, businesses. Uh, because once again, uh, we really need such metals for the energy transition. So uh, mining is never clean. It's never green. It's always dirty. But I like to talk about the word responsible mining, which means that you can do better and actually you can make it acceptable. And this is the direction we have to take. Sorry for interrupting. Let's go back to geopolitics. Of course, yeah. Well, let's talk about where are these mines? Um, you said in your book that Britain benefited during the Industrial Revolution from having large supplies of yep. coal, which could be used to power steam engines. Um, but when we turn to the modern period and, and rare earth elements, which countries have abundant supplies of these? Yeah, actually, um, we in the West, it may change in the future, in the medium term future. But as I speak today, we in the West, we don't extract these metals. We used to, um, talking about rare earths, for example, uh, the French used to refine the rare earths, most of the rare earths, back in the 1990s. The Australians, and more specifically, Linus Company, used to extract the rare earths back in the 1990s. Same with the Americans, with the company whose name was Molycorp. But, you know, the extraction of these metals was dirty. And for this reason, it was decided that extraction and refining would be closed. Uh, operation would be stopped in the Western countries that I've mentioned. And uh, that is what I'm saying about rare earths, basically true for most of the other metals of the energy transition. And when you look at the share today of the United States, for example, and Europe, in the world mining production, uh, the US is 5%, European uh, Union is 3%. It's just nothing compared to what it used to be. We closed mines, we closed refineries, and we let other countries do the dirty job because we didn't want to have our hands dirty. And uh, back into the 80s and back to the 90s, the Chinese were very keen to open their mines to uh, you know, make their deposits available for the markets where the Westerners didn't want to do the dirty job. And we let the Chinese actually extract, notably among other things, the rare earths. And now if we look at the world production of these metals, well, it's, 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 uh, it's many countries. It can be Bolivia, Chile, um, and, and Argentina for lithium, 
Chile for copper. It can be the Democratic Republic of Congo for cobalt. It is South Africa for platinoids. It may be Russia for nickel, for example. But most of the metals for a green world come from China. And China holds between 40 and 80% of the world production of these metals. China stands for 60% of the world production of rare earths and 80% uh, world extraction of rare earths, plus uh, refines the rare earths which are being produced elsewhere in the world. And that means that China either extracts and or refines 80% of the world rare earths. That is an OPEC on steroids, as uh, some uh, you know university researchers are, are saying, and I'm quoting here Dudley Kingsnores from Australia. That is an OPEC on steroids. You get more as a single country than any other country uh, with oil. And even as the OPEC as a total amount of countries, 13, 14 countries with oil. And what does China do when they hold so many resources which are strategic? China just doesn't want to sell the resource. They want to sell the electric cars. So they've been going down the value chain for the last 20 years, moving from the air rare earth to the magnet, moving from the lithium to the cell, and from the cell to the battery, and from the battery to the uh, to the to the to the final product, which is a car. And China today amounts for uh, more than 50% of the world sales of electric cars. Um, so China has been very clever accepting as the dark side of these metals, which come with an environmental cost, but turning it into an advantage into the in the mining business by going down the value chain and holding the entire value chain from the mine to the lab where the electric vehicles are, are being done. And this is a reality today. Mm. And of course, as you, as you mentioned, um, it wasn't always the case that China dominated rare earth metal production. Um, you say that between 1965 to 1985, the US was the global leader. And, uh, and you tell quite an interesting story of how uh, Molly Corp, which uh, ran a mine at Mountain Pass in California, um, found itself embroiled in scandals over poison groundwater. Uh, and at one point they were even visited by armed federal agents. Uh, with employees yeah. sent on a, a mandatory training course um, about the desert turtle, which was allegedly threatened by their activities. Um, but isn't this just really typical of the Western environmental standards? Doesn't this indicate that it would be impossible to move mining back towards Western countries because mm. China can always do it more cheaply because they mm. will cut corners on environmental uh, and health standards? Uh, that is a very good question, Mark. The thing is, we've been discovering for the last 10 years that we are dependent upon Chinese supplies for strategic resources. And uh, a wake-up call, among other calls, uh, took place in the United States under the Trump presidency. And uh, uh, I don't appreciate Trump for many things, but I do appreciate Trump when it's about understanding the US dependency upon rare earth supplies from China. And I have to mention here that rare earths are also necessary for defense technologies. You need rare earths for F-35 jets. You need rare earths for guided precision missiles. And Trump understood better than any, better than any of these predecessors that he couldn't be dependent upon Beijing for the supply of these resources. And he politically revived the necessity of finding alternative resources. And what Joe Biden is doing today in the United States is nothing different in the rare earth business in, in terms when it comes to rare earths from what uh, his predecessors did. He's trying to revive the rare earth business by reopening mines uh, of rare earths on the US territory. Actually, the Mountain Pass mine which was operated at the time, as you said, by Molly Corp, has reopened and is now operated by ML Resource and is producing ore. And then you have also uh, the Pentagon funding the development of refineries in the United States for, uh, and also the market of magnets being revived. It, discussion take place around, um, uh, you know, limiting time 
of delivering mining permits in the United States so that new mines, including lithium mines in Nevada, California, can open for, for electric batteries, for, for, for electric cars. And also it's, it's about uh, uh, strategic stocks. There is a national different stockpile which, have, which exists in the United States and know it's about stockpiling these resources in case there will be any crisis in the future. And, uh, you know, we have no choice. The, the, the question is being understood that, uh, you know, the West must wake up, must react to this Chinese dominance and produce its own resource in order to make sure that they're, they're able to, to conduct the energy transition. And uh, the, the reaction in the United States is about opening new mines, and it's also happening in Europe. No, you're asking a good question. Will uh, will it be that easy? And it's not, it's not going to be easy uh, because when it's about opening a mine of lithium, it's about telling to the people around, oh, I'm sorry, we haven't told you something about the green technologies. We haven't told you that in order to drive green, you will have we will have to dig deeper. And the people are just like, but what are you talking about? It's been 10 years since I've been watching advertisements on TV telling me is that I would drive green anytime soon. I know you're telling me that I have to accept a mine in my backyard. So the social acceptation of future mines uh, popping up everywhere in the Western world will be long because we, you know, start from such a, you know, uh, we, we start from, we, we are coming from, this, uh, from, from, sorry, from a world where we really believe that, uh, you know, that would, that would be zero impact. So this is going to be difficult. I would like to believe that I would like to be optimistic in a way, uh, taking one example, which is a French example of a company whose name is Imeris, which recently said they would open a mine in 2027 uh, in the center of France, in the region of Allier. And that was quite accepted by local populations and, and by uh, also NGOs. And people understand the link between lithium and, 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 and batteries. The United States have reopened the rare earth operations uh, in mountain pass, as I said, but they have a problem. They don't have the refinery. So they have to send the, the ore to be refined in China. So that doesn't make a sustainable uh, sovereign business. So they need to develop also the the the, the down the stream down the, the downstream chain, including the refineries, and that will take, according to an official document in the United States, uh, 15 years for the United States to develop the downstream chain value chain of the rare earths, uh, only of the rare earths for only the different needs of the United States. So that's going to take time, but we have no choice in this world where we see these growing tensions between China and the Western world. Hmm. I got a, a laugh out of reading your book um, because you cite a statistic, which I suppose is based on a survey, which says that supposedly 16 million adults in the United States believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Um, and of course, that's intended to, to illustrate the ignorance that all of us have to some extent uh, about the origins of the products that we we consume. Um, would you tell us a bit more what exactly are the environmental and, and human costs of the Chinese production uh, of some of these rares? Because I, I understand you went on some field trips, didn't you, in order to see for yourself the you know, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Sure. We have gained uh, buying power over the last 30 years, but we've lost buying knowledge. And obviously, when you order a pizza, you don't even know what your pizza is made of. So not even talking about what's inside an EV. Nobody has a clear idea about what's inside an EV. Uh, in an EV, you find, among other things, rare earths. And if you go back to China, which produces uh, and refines 80% of the rare earths in the world, you have to go to Baotou. Baotou is a city in the autonomous province of Inner Mongolia. Baotou is 800 kilometers northwest of Beijing. And Baotou is where, uh, or and its area is where the rare earths are extracted and refined. And uh, the refining areas are in the outskirts of the city. And I've been myself in China four times uh, over the last uh, 12 years uh, in order to report in China and um, notably and mostly on, on, on mining uh, practices. And I've been to Baotou twice. 
And what you see in the outskirts of, of, of the city of Baotou is this huge manufacturer operated by Baogong, which is a, a company, Chinese company, refining the metals. And uh, the rare earths are being separated into these manufacturers from iron and thorium and uranium. And uh, for separating uh, these rare earths, you need chemicals, you need water. And the water is filled with chemicals and heavy metals. And it's not being treated outside of the manufacturing. It's just being directly rejected into an artificial lake. What's name is the Mekong Dam. It's a huge lake where the water is just being dumped without any environmental responsibility whatsoever. And you have cancer villages around. People living in what they call cancer villages because uh, they have seen, they have observed that there are higher rates of cancers where they live uh, more than any other place in the region. And they somehow make a connection between these dirty activities and, and their health. Actually, even officials speak you know, in front of the cameras that I've used in order to interview them and talk about companies over there being irresponsible, doing whatever they want, whatever the regulations which are supposed to be applied in, in the Mongolia. And I once remember speaking to a Chinese expert of rare earths. Her name is Vivian Vu. And Vivian Vu said to me, but you know, uh, China has devastated its environment to feed the rest of the world with rare earths. What does it tell us, Mark? It tells us that uh, sometimes clean technologies is a dirty business. And we don't know that. We in the West, we are so proud to claim our responsibilities toward future generations by saying we are doing our ecological transition by driving green and heating our homes with clean electricity. But we just completely forget that in order to make the sun and the wind in electricity, you need to turn this electricity, it's being turned into electricity through uh, technologies such as solar panels and wind turbines. And these wind turbines and solar panels need to, to be manufactured somewhere. And anything comes from the ground. Anything that is clean and green comes from the sky in the ground. But it's because it's so far, because it's, you know, six, seven, ten thousand kilometers away from where we live, because no one's get there. It's dangerous to get there as a journalist. I, I, I took some risks. I was illegal. I was not official. It's hard to bring back the pictures and to bring back the people speaking about that, what, what they, what their life. Nobody really, 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 is really aware about that. But, you know, there's a dark side to these green technologies. It comes at a cost. And uh, we must face that reality. Mm. Your, your book's title is The Rare Metals War. Um, you say that from the 2000s, um, China began to introduce quotas and taxes on its exports of metals such as uh, magnesium, manganese, yellow phosphorus and zinc. Um, however, you argue that that was not the start of the rare metals war, but in fact, it came later in September 2010, when China directly weaponized its exports yep. of rare earths to Japan, uh, following a conflict over the Senkaku Islands. Um, and you go on to explain that although there was no official declaration of an embargo, um, deliveries of rare earth metals just stopped to Japan. Uh, and of course, Japan produces a lot of high-tech consumer goods that require rare metals to work. Um, my question to you would be, do you foresee similar such embargoes happening again? Uh, could China cut off the flow of rare metals to, to Western countries uh, to get their way? For example, um, if they stand in their way from taking control of Taiwan, that is a difficult question, Mark. Uh, China has already cut off supplies of rare earths. It has threatened in 2019, it has threatened the United States to cut off supplies again of rare earths amid um, trade tensions uh, that was at the time Donald Trump was still in office. But they didn't actually, uh, you know, apply it. They didn't make that threat come to reality. Um, I think what China is doing today and what they will do in the future is much more subtle. It's not about cutting supplies as they did in the past, 
uh, or as the Russians are doing with the Europeans, it's much more clever and subtle. What they do is that this, they either they produce the metals themselves or because they don't have lithium or not much lithium on their territory. The Chinese don't have much cobalt and nickel on their territory, but they have very good mineral diplomacy. They're able to get the, the, the resource from Australia and Chile for lithium, for example, and they can get the rare earths from the United States and Burma, for example, bring it back to their territory, find the rare earths and the lithium on their territory. And once they have all these resources, which is huge, a large part of the world production of rare earths and lithium, they just keep this resource for their own industries. And when you, as a, you know, as a Western consumer, come and say to the Chinese, sell me your lithium, but the Chinese say, they don't say, I'm going to cut off the supplies. They say, but there is no lithium anymore because I've used all the lithium uh, that I had for my own needs. This is much more subtle. I have, the Chinese say, a huge market of 1.4 billion people they want to get richer. They need, they need to do their own energy transition. I've done my best refining and extracting the resource. And I've used these resources for my electric cars made in China, for my solar panels and wind turbines made in China. And there's nothing left. And they have not cut supplies. They just tell you, I don't have the resource anymore. But if you want to buy an electric car from my BYD brand, oh, yes, for sure, I'll sell it to you. But I won't sell it to you at a cheap price. I sell it to you at the price of an, of an end product, which is very expensive. So the way for the Chinese to do and what they are going to do in the future is, in my view, not cut off supplies. It comes with many bad, you know, many, uh, uh, many uh, very bad publicity for them. But they will keep saying, I don't sell you the resource and I sell you my finished product. And in the trade balance that I have, uh, in Beijing compared to other countries, that is a good thing. So we must get prepared in the West if we don't react to keep buying solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and other EVs rather than buying uh, the, 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 the primary product just out of the mine. This is what's going to happen. Of course, so to some extent, it's outdated. Uh, to think of China as just producing raw materials or, or toys or textiles um, I agree with you. because they're moving um, up the value chain. Um, could you explain you. What, what you saw when, when you visited China's so-called um, Silicon Valley of rare earths uh, in uh, Baotou? Because yeah. you, you told us about the cancer villages, but they're, they're sort of a, a brighter side there as well now. Yeah, it's uh, you're right to insist upon that point. About to, uh, it not, it's not only about uh, rare earth mines and refinery refineries. It's about the Silicon Valley of rare earths, as they call it, where Western companies, among other companies, are coming and signing joint ventures. And basically, the deal is clear. Uh, the Chinese say we can't, you know, give you the resource, but if you come to China. Well, the resource would be here available to you in, you know, in the same ways that it is available for Chinese companies. And you will have unlimited access to cheap resources as long as you settle in China. Why don't you settle in the uh, Baotou Technological Park and you get unlimited access to rare earths? But there is one condition. You sign a joint venture. This joint venture is being uh, owned at 51% by Chinese interests. This may have changed, have changed a little bit for the last years under the pressure of the United States, but still, this has been the rule over the last decades. And because I give you my, uh, my resources, you give me in exchange your knowledge because this joint venture is a way for you to give me your gray cells. Uh, in exchange for the materials. In that respect, the Chinese have been able to learn a lot from uh, Western technologies and to go down the value chain in a much more, in a much quicker way. Now to today, or the last time I went there, that was uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, was a lively, thriving city, a rich and modern city filled with, uh, uh, you know, skyscrapers, and, and Chinese of the middle class 
really to 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 enjoy the benefits of uh, of uh, of uh, neo capitalism uh, imported from the West and turn into a state capitalism or uh, socialist Chinese socialism uh, with the specific characteristics. Uh, so it's it's become a rich country, and this strategy that I've, that I've explained from Beijing being patient enough over the 25 last years to start from the mine and to patiently go down the value chain by being able to manufacture the high-end product, not jeans, not toys, EVs, batteries, solar panels, computers, supercalculators, uh, quantum technologies. Uh, this China has gotten richer and Baotu is an embodiment of that. Hmm. You refer to a term which is uh, quite cute, called uh, panda diplomacy. Uh, it's this idea of a benevolent China that, that gifts panda bears to countries that it, it wants to forge ties with. Um, I think it's, it's sort of a, a friendly way to look at China as an emerging power, but at the same time as a benevolent one. Um, but I think it's fair to say that you're quite sceptical um, of that idea. Is that right? That you're sceptical of China as, as a benevolent yeah. force on the world stage? Uh, and if so, what what do you think the CCP wants? What sort of threat does China pose to the West, in your view? Yeah, uh, I was already uh, very sceptical about this uh, positive image that China wants to convey at the international stage. And that was way before the COVID happened. And what we've seen in terms of Chinese attitude towards the rest of the world uh, during the sanitary crisis. But yeah, as, as you know, the panda is he's a wonderful animal, uh, which, uh, you know, conveys a positive message. Uh, and in my view, uh, well, China has a revenge to take. Uh, China has a revenge to take to history. Uh, to itself and to the West. Uh, when you go to the summer uh, palace uh, in Beijing, uh, this is a, a wonderful place which was completely destroyed in the 19th century by the French and the British. Uh, and the Chinese have not forgotten that. And in a way, they know uh, what we did to them, uh, the wars that took place on their territory to make opium uh, you know to to make opium thrive as a, as a, as a, as, a, as a commodity and in a way they want to take a revenge over their poor attitude and also what they consider as being our poor attitude china has been an empire and could be the only country which could become an empire twice and they have high expectations uh, and one of the dates where they expect to, you know, uh, uh, to to reach this goal is 2049, uh, which is an important date in their in their in their cosmology. And uh, they really have expectations of being richer and and also the most important, the first military nation in the world. And under the watch of Xi Jinping, but here, Mark, I'm not a Chinese. I'm not a specialist of Chinese politics. Even if I've written about China, I I don't think this country, uh, you know, uh, progressing in a peaceful way. Uh, neither do I see the United States progressing in a peaceful way. By the way, I think uh, I'm afraid when I when I see what's going on, I can see you know you know aggressive declarations on one hand on the Asian side, but also followed by aggressive declarations on the Western side. Europe is probably in the middle here and, and don't want to take sides in, in this future war coming up. Hopefully there won't be any war. But yeah, uh, China, uh, you know, uh, he's here, uh, a powerful country which wants to become a more powerful country. Rare earths, rare metals are necessary for also its defense technologies. And uh, going into the rare earths business and its application for Chinese defense systems was also a way to look at their ambitions. Uh, in in the future, which may not be as peaceful as we, we might expect. Mm. But speaking uh, of China uh, and panda bears, I think there's also a sort of bear case for for the so-called middle kingdom. Um, we hear a lot about the idea of China surpassing the Western world uh, one day. Um, but 
Do you think it's possible that we're we're falling into the same trap as the West did uh, during the Cold War of overestimating our rival? Uh, because famously, Western leaders believe that the communist model was capable of producing more output than capitalist economies. Uh, and it was only after the Soviet system came crashing down on itself that, that the inefficiencies became apparent to everyone. Uh, and, and I think on a gut level, I find it hard to believe that China, uh, which, as you mentioned in your book, uh, employs two million government agents to police online expression, uh, could really be more sophisticated uh, and innovative as a society uh, than the economies of the Western world. Um, do you think there's an extent to which we're sort of overplaying um, the sure. risk from, from China? I don't have a precise answer to your question, Mark. Uh, obviously, we have two radically different innovation models here. We've got uh, a state-led uh, innovation model, which comes from China, versus an innovation model which gives as much creativity as possible to individual human beings and which relies upon their own uh, creativity to uh, reshape uh, the world uh, with all the mythology of the garage in the Silicon Valley where some young students may have started a business which, which, which became a world company. Um, we in the West were absolutely certain until I would say five years ago that this US-led model based on individuals, on letting them express their creativity, was the strongest model ever for innovation. But the Chinese developed a state-led innovation capacities, which has proved to be extraordinarily successful. And whether we want it or not, it's successful. And we have here two ways of looking at innovation two models, two ways at organizing a society which compete with each other. And recently, China has gained the credibility and legitimacy in saying "But your system, you guys in the West, is not the only one that must be widely and universally accepted by the rest of the world because I can do at least as good or maybe even better with a system which completely works differently and which is based on state power and also on control and surveillance. And we are in a new Cold War in a way, Mark. I was nine when the years old when the Beijing, uh, when the Beijing, when the Berlin Wall uh, fell. And until that day, we were not sure whether the West had a system which would prove to be better than the USSR system. It was a, it was a war over values. And we are exactly reproducing this same opposition between a Western liberal system and other systems which actually claim to be more efficient, including for innovation, by organizing their populations completely differently. And to be honest, I would like to believe that my system is the best, but actually I'm not sure we're going to get over. I'm not sure. I cannot say anything about how China will evolve and what will be the future of the Chinese system over the next 20 or 30 years, maybe democracy in the West will fall before. I don't know. I, I just don't know. But we are today in this uh, confrontation and always, always rare earths, rare metals is a little detail uh, that opens 180 degrees the doors of, of such a discussion. It's always a way to 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 look at uh, at 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 to 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 uh, to to analyze this confrontation. China has been much better until now at producing the metals of a greener world. Thanks to China, we have the metals for making cheap solar panels. China has legitimacy to sell to tell us I've done better than you guys on the climate front in the climate war. So why wouldn't you believe that authoritarianism is it a better system than liberalism? Because we have been able to envision the world 25 years ahead and to make sure that these resources are sufficient enough in order to, to respect the Paris agreements. I mean, in a way, I can't, I, I can understand that. It's, it's understandable. It's uncomfortable for me to say so, but it's understandable. So rare earth is a way to understand the war of values. 
uh, that is taking place now. Mm. Bringing the uh, conversation back towards rare metals, um, our channel Resource Talks is mainly focused on, on natural resources from the perspective of a retail investor. So the viewers and I, we personally enjoy trying to, to make, although often losing, uh, money by speculating on, on stock prices of natural resources companies. Um, so my question for you is sort of a personal one. I know that you're a journalist who, who looks at this really from more of an academic angle, but have you ever become interested at, um, from an investing perspective, given the massive growth in demand, as well as the supply rigidity that, that your research has identified for some of these matters? No, uh, Mark, I've never been interested from an investor's perspective. Um, to be honest, I, I remain a journalist. Somehow, I think I may, I should have invested some, uh, about some shares from some specific mining companies that I've known for the last 10 years. I'm thinking about Linus, for example. Linus is an Australian company producing wares today. And recently, I was looking at the evolution of the share of Linus for the last five years. And it's gone like, I think, 5 thousand persons grows over the last five years. And I said to myself, I should at least have bought one share of this Linus company. And I would be much richer today than what I am. But to be honest, that's not my mindset. And also maybe uh, that's my ethics as a journalist. Um, I don't think my message would be understood as well as it. I hope it is if I uh, had to reckon that I own a personal business financial interests in uh, this world that I'm talking about, in this business that I'm talking about. And I think it's, 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 it's good, it's healthy uh, to keep away personally, to not have any link, uh, financial speaking, with the mining business. I can support them, I can say what I think about how good it is to invest in mines, but not as being myself, uh, part of, of this industry. Otherwise, there will be kind of a conflict of, of interest here. So keep me away from the mining world, but that doesn't prevent me from talking about it and talking freely about what I think. Mm. Just to finish up, I mean, your book is full of very fascinating statistics for people who are interested in the natural resources space. Uh, and in the appendix, the, there's a table which um, shows the lifespan of the viable reserves of the principal metals needed for the energy transition, a long title. Um, but then you list lots of metals uh, and you have the number of years estimated by some researcher um, that we have remaining based on a series of assumptions about the current rate of production and consumption. Um, antimony, which I'd never heard of, Apparently, we only have between four to 12 years left of that. Tin, we only have six to 17. Lead, seven to 18 years. Gold, seven to 18 years. And then uh, the, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got lithium. Uh, and apparently, we've got as much as 400 years of that. Um, so I guess my, my question to you, I mean, clearly, all of these forecasts uh, are only as good as, as the data that's put into the model. Um, but what what minerals or what what metals do you see as being the most sort of endangered at risk in the, in this moment the most important metals uh, in the future will be arguably nickel lithium copper rare earths um, these metals which are absolutely necessary for the energy transition um, we had this discussion with before uh, the figures that you've mentioned, if we, uh, if you invite me again on a resource talk in 10 years, these figures will be the same. Because on one hand, we will have uh, consumed more of these resources, but on the other hand, exploration techniques, exploitation techniques, uh, circular economy, recycling will have become much better. And this is a race between the, you know, the, 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 the development of our lifestyles, uh, models, and also the development of technologies which help sustain such, such lifestyles. So I don't see with the metals as you mentioned in the short or medium term, a situation coming up where actually we just 
wouldn't have any more of these resources. There is maybe one exception, which is often discussed by the expert, which is cobalt. And cobalt is definitely a resource where supply may come to an end in the relatively short term. This is maybe the only exception. Now, the good news is that cobalt can be replaced by nickel. And actually, uh, Elon Musk is desperately looking for nickel supplies uh, for its uh, the batteries of its Tesla cars, uh, because he is replacing cobalt by nickel. So every problem, in a way, has a solution. So in the future, Mark, we will be relying upon all the metals that you've mentioned. We'll use all the metals that are in the Mendeleev table. We'll use more of them, and at the same time, there will be new technologies in order to afford us to make it possible to use more of them. But it won't be enough. And there will be needs for more resources, a more important diversity of resources. And this is why I know it's a question, for example, we discuss, it's being discussed in, in China as a possibility of manufacturing sodium ion batteries rather than lithium ion. So lithium will be replaced by sodium. Lithium iron phosphate batteries are a way to uh, to replace lithium cobalt nickel batteries. So you just do away with cobalt and nickel and you use iron and phosphates and iron is much more widely available in the, in the, in the earth's crust. So the energy transition will be successful, only successful. First, if we change our consumption lifestyles, and I, I may very much, uh, you know, uh, be uh, very skeptical about such a change or, and if we recycle, and if we develop circular economy in order to do more with less, and circular economy is a huge challenge, a, a huge challenge. And if we are able to substitute certain resources by others, and in the future we will see appearing on our watch in the radars some resources which are not rare, which are widely available, such as sodium and iron, but which will become very strategic for making the energy transition. So the energy transition, we rely on a more diversified pack of resources, some that we don't even have an idea of right now, and it will, uh, or it won't be, or this uh, transition won't be. And if you invite me, the discussion will take place not only on rare earths, but on resources that we didn't even think about, including, for example, sodium and iron, which could be very, very strategic in the future. Mm, fascinating. Guillaume, I know you have to run now, so thank you very much for your time. Today. My pleasure. Uh, the book is The Rare Metals War, The Dark Side of Clean Energy and Digital Technologies, presumably available from uh, all online marketplaces, all good bookstores, yes. as they say. Thanks again for coming on, and uh, we hope to have you back again when your, your next book comes out. With great pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.